Hello and welcome back to the Neurotransmitters. I am Dr. Michael Kentris and I'm so glad that you're joining us today. I am joined again by my good friend, Dr. Ashley Paul. How are you doing today, Ashley? I'm great. How are you? Also great. Uh, I am sitting, we're recording this on, at least where I am, a snowy January morning. So I get to look out my window and see all the pine trees dusted with snow. It's very, very relaxing. <laughs> I have a similar view in Baltimore, Maryland. So uh, a good day for reflection. Yes. And I was I was very intrigued when you suggested this a few weeks ago. So, uh, you know, a lot of times, right, it's I know we're a little into the new year at this point, but it's still January. And a lot of people take time for New Year's resolutions, looking back at the past year. And uh, you had this interesting idea of looking back and professionally as neurologists, what are some of our our big takeaways uh, from this past year. So kind of uh, lead us lead us down this a little bit here. What was your thought process? Well, I do like using January not actually to make resolutions because, you know, those are always easily broken. We have this like shot of motivation in January. And so everyone joins a gym and does all these things in the beginning. Uh, but I, I think January is a great time to actually reflect and think about what we learned and how we're going to use that to pivot and maybe make new habits or new strategies and or new pathways for the year going forward. And so, and I try to actually use the whole month of January to do this because it's really hard to just, you know, do that all in one day, right? So I think of January as sort of like a test month where I'll try ideas. No, I think that's, that's really important. Um, and uh, we were talking before we hit record and, you know, I, I said that I'd uh, started a journaling habit and, uh, the last two, three months. And similarly to what you said about New Year's resolutions, I tend to start my resolutions like one to two months in advance of the New Year's. Cause like, I, I don't know. It's my my anti-bandwagon uh, sentiment. I, I tend to be stubborn by nature. So I want to start something at a different time. So I, I started more regular exercise program and uh, and journaling. And the reflection part is, I think, if you look at anyone who talks about journaling online or uh, any books on the subject, the reflection part, like it's one thing to write your thoughts down to, to have available to future you, but to look back at them and take stock of them and kind of think like, what does this mean now to me in the present context, I think is, is where the true value tends to come through on that. Yes, exactly. As humans, we tend to live a lot in the past or the future, right? And this is sort of bringing both of those elements, I think, to your present self. Um, yeah. So I, I think it's a nice thing to do. And as I was doing this with my husband and just our personal lives, I started thinking about it in the context of my life as a neurologist. And so I, I was thinking about some of the prompts that we were using. And this is just something, you know, we Googled and we found some prompts online that we were going through and it was a nice exercise. And I just immediately thought about how we can use these same prompts really to think about uh, neuro neurology. So yeah. um, I don't want to put you on the spot. So, but if you want to try, <laughs> all right, all right. Uh, this, a is, question. This, is, this is happening live. All right. Lay it on yeah. me. <laughs> all right. So in 2023, as a neurologist, what is one of the wisest decisions you've made? Mm. So I always hesitate to use the word wise when applying it to anything I'm thinking <laughs> or doing. Uh, that way lies madness. But uh, things that perhaps, let's say, were less foolish, uh, if I reframe <laughs> it in that fashion. So one of the things, and I don't know that this is necessarily new, but it's something that I feel is continually re-emphasized to me, is the the need professionally right we get a you know i work mostly in the hospital uh doing inpatient neurology and a lot of times i will get a consult that at first blush appears frivolous and you know we we all tend to by default i assume uh think the worst of this consult like ah why are they consulting me this seems like a waste of time etc cetera, etc cetera. Oh, yeah. And, Thank you for this consult. <laughs> right, right. And ultimately, while they there are those there, I often find that 
if I don't do the consult, I do end up regretting it. Um, which is to say, and I, I will say that is very, very, very rare. Um, but I will, I will moan and groan and, you know, beat my breast <laughs> complaining to the heavens as I, uh, trudge my way there and I get there and I'm talking to the person and I'm like, Oh, this is, this is not what was advertised in the initial consult. <laughs> so if I were to, to say one thing is to, to remain humble, uh, I, I would say that is a constant daily battle against my own hubris and pride uh, because I am wrong so often, either whether I am just getting a story from somebody else or going and making my own impression that taking shortcuts in medicine is always a way that will lead you to ruin uh, yes. in some fashion or another. Ruin might be a bit of a strong word, but it will lead you to mistakes. And it's it's always important to to avoid the, if we were to apply, put on our uh, cognitive biases hat, that uh, premature closure uh, for our differential diagnosis. So that that premature closure, if you will, is definitely something that I think I am susceptible to and being aware of my own biases and my flaws in my thinking processes is definitely something that it's constantly reiterated to me. And I think the challenge is like so many of us in medicine, when patient volumes are higher, mm -hmm. you're getting bombarded by phone calls from every angle, right? It's a lot of this task switching and mm -hmm. literal like bodily and cognitive fatigue. So juggling these things and managing patients in an appropriate yet efficient manner is, is definitely a skill that I am still struggling to develop, uh, at least to my own uh, desired level. And it's probably a process that will continue my entire career, if not life. <laughs> yes. And, you know, it's, it's human nature, right? Uh, our brains like to take shortcuts and the heuristics. And I, I was thinking uh, for our colleagues who are consulting a neurologist, um, sometimes I know people struggle to frame the question in a way that makes sense to us, mm -hmm. right? And which is why you get to the bedside and you're like, oh, okay, this is actually something different. Maybe it's actually something even more interesting than what was advertised. Right, um, right. Or maybe they just didn't ask the right question and I sort of changed the consult <laughs> to, to the question that should have been asked. Right. But I remember, I remember being an intern and having to make a consult. And it was like, you know, my first month of residency. And I was kind of terrified. And mm -hmm. I forget who I was calling. I think it was a cardiologist and I could hear the annoyance on the other end like why are you calling about this and I simply said something to the effect of you know I, I don't actually understand all the concepts behind this and I am eager to learn more um, if you could teach me and suddenly that just melted that barrier and this person I was speaking to was like oh okay yes I'd be happy to teach you and go over and like I'll meet you at the bedside and and that made it much more of a collaborative experience where I also learned from the consultant and right. the patient got the care that they needed. And, you know, so uh, keeping humility on all ends, I think, is important. Um, right. And that uh, I think there was a study that came out in the last one to two years where it was looking at like the perceived, quote unquote, appropriateness of consults for neurology versus internal medicine residents and uh, like who thinks they should know more about neurology versus general medicine and uh, their their perceptions amongst those two groups of individuals. And it kind of mirrors what we've been talking about where, you know, the person, the, the consulted usually thinks the person consulting should know more, but, mm -hmm. but that, yeah, it is one of those things where having humility is like uh, they're, asking a question because they don't know or they're concerned about something and being generous of spirit is is always it's it's never the wrong way to go right but, it's, um, it's hard to do at times though i, I think yeah, i think th i think the perceived problem comes in when you when you perceive this as a someone dumping work on you right uh, when they when you believe that they have the ability to handle this but perhaps they don't have that same self-perception and so that uh, that discordance amongst um, perceived abilities is probably where some of this um, potential resentment comes in, and and it is challenging, right? Uh, mm -hmm. 
especially if we're talking like you know resource limited settings, things like that. But we should always try and uh, approach things with with a, a generous heart, if you will. Yeah, absolutely. Um, and when I was thinking about this question for myself, one of the wisest decisions I actually thought about a specific case, and um, I have a. I forget how old she is. I think she's in her late seventies, um, a woman with Parkinson's disease for well over 20 years. And I've been taking care of her for the past couple of years. And in one of our follow-ups, she told me about how she had such severe constipation that, uh, she had nausea and vomiting. She had to be hospitalized for it. And, you know, now things are a little more regular, but, she still didn't gain back the weight. I mean, she lost tremendous amount of weight in this whole ordeal. And unfortunately, she also seemed to have developed this paranoia about processed or packaged food. And otherwise she was pretty much herself, but it was just, it was a little unsettling. And at this point I've known her for a couple of years and it was just, she was just a little bit off. And I know she was always someone who tried to trend on the healthier side of things. Like she's baked things for me and it's like, oh, it's only four ingredients, you know? Um, So I I know that she has a leaning towards that, but like to be completely paranoid about food when she's lost this much weight is not like her. And her husband, you know, thought, well, you know, she just needs counseling or something. Like, I don't know why she's acting this way. And then in my mind, it just, you know, there was this thought that, well, what if this is something more organic? maybe I should just check. Right. Mm -hmm. And so I ordered all the, you know, metabolic panels and, uh, like B12 and B1. And it turned out that she had actually a pretty profound thiamine deficiency, which, you know, how many times you might've ordered that and it's normal. Right. (laughs) And, um, thiamine levels are actually not a great marker anyway of whether someone's deficient as I dove into the literature about this, but, yeah. So she was beginning to develop a Wernicke's encephalopathy, right? But she didn't have a full classic triad, right? So the triad of ophthalmoplegia, uh, ataxia, right? Being off balance mm-hmm. or loose loss of coordination and, and then the confusion. Mm-hmm. Um, and when I read about it, I mean, even the mental status changes could be so variable, right? It mm-hmm. could be delirium. <laughs> It could be yeah. something like what she presented with, which was just kind of this weird paranoia and really nothing else. You know, so she's fully oriented otherwise, you know, and she knows all yeah. about her Parkinson's disease these days. I will say that was the one time she did not bring me treats because she's always worried that I'm not eating lunch. <laughs> she's she's such a sweet woman. She's, That's you know. <laughs> yeah, I think there was this one time where I was running late and instead of being upset that I was running late, she was more worried about that I must have skipped lunch to try to catch up on time. And, was she right? Well, yes, she was. But <laughs> <laughs> since then, she would bring me like little snacks. And this was the one time she did not which was also a little unusual. <laughs> mm-hmm. and, and yeah. Yeah. To, to your point, uh, I've, I've run into that kind of situation, not as longitudinally, but uh, only it's, I think it's around 20% or so have the full triad, right? It's, it's a pretty yeah. low percentage overall of these, of these patients. It is. And um you know, I think uh, a lot of us we forget we, we always think of its association with alcohol abuse, but right. um, weight loss of any kind. I would say I've seen it just as much in those patients um, as I have with uh, people who have a history with alcohol. Right, exactly. And she was in the hospital. Not a, she wasn't at my hospital. She lives in a different state, but at her local hospital. I mean, she was there for like three weeks, and no one had checked. Oh my. You know. Yeah. Uh, and it's no one had thought to because she wasn't quirky enough, right? <laughs> she right, wasn't, right, right. And she, you know, of course she's off balance. She has Parkinson's disease. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, right. So right. That, uh, that diagnostic anchoring. Um, yeah, exactly. So as soon as I saw that, I, you know, ordered, actually I ordered her intramuscular uh, uh, thymine. Yes. And I told them if they couldn't get it to go to the hospital and get IV because parenteral is not actually recommended. I mean, parenteral is recommended. Oral is not recommended. Right, right, right. Uh, because you, you just won't repeat quickly enough or right. reliably. And yeah, that's basically like anyone, uh, again, my more of an inpatient practice, but anyone who comes in with a history of 
of alcohol abuse or weight loss who's confused at all, I uh, I load them up with IV thiamine. It's like, you know, it could be. And even if we send out the labs, as you suggested, um, it takes sometimes like close to two weeks, at least for us here, yeah. to get those results back, right? And what am I going to do? Sit around? I mean, it's, it's B1. It ain't going to hurt nobody. Exactly. So, yeah. And, and that's another thing, you know, as an outpatient neurologist, right? It, this was this is so much easier inpatient, right? I would have just probably just given her IV thiamine if I was even thinking about it. But I I didn't actually right away. You know, I, I just ordered the labs because it was in the back of my mind. And I told them what I was thinking about. And then when it came back, actually like nearly undetectable. <laughs> oh, wow. That is quite low. Yeah, it was very low. I don't know if I've ever seen it that low. Um, oh. yeah. So uh, I'm glad she, she's back to normal now. That's uh, awesome. After, That's great. Yeah. Yeah. And there was no, you know, changes on her MRI, which is a good thing, right? Because right. if we're starting to see signal changes, right, in the mammillary bodies or in the thalamus, well, then we might be a little bit late in the game and some of these mm-hmm. changes could then become permanent. So Absolutely. I was just thanking the universe <laughs> that we caught it in time. Um, yeah. yeah. And I think that's, that's great. That's like, I think that's probably the best thing out of your story is right. That change in someone when you're seeing something that doesn't fit like the, the, if you will, the illness script of like, what is natural progression in, in someone with Parkinson's disease, right? It's like something else is going on. Yeah. Um, and I think that's a, that's a great takeaway is to having that longitudinal relationship with somebody so you can pick up those very subtle changes. You know, that's, that's a, that's a great part of outpatient practice. Yeah. And we were talking a lot about metacognition, right. Of Mm -hmm. sort of zooming out and thinking about how you think about clinical reasoning. And I've been thinking about that more as I've been trying to figure out how to teach this to medical students. Mm -hmm. And because that medical student had to ask me one time, because he kind of saw it it in action. I was sitting with a patient and I thought this was going to be straightforward Parkinson's disease. And I had the, pa- uh, the student do the neurological exam. And they were trying to do finger to nose. And the way this patient was following the exam maneuver, you, you could see he was struggling to even understand, you know, finger goes to nose and then turn around mm-hmm. and then goes to the outstretched finger, right? Like yeah. he was struggling like to more, just follow that yeah, sequence. Like more executive kind of yeah. stuff? Yeah. And so yeah. then I pivoted and started doing checking for cortical sensory loss and Mm -hmm. wondering if this was more of like a cortical basal syndrome phenotype. And yeah, I mean, he's, I think he still actually has alpha synuclein as the underlying pathology, but Mm -hmm. the phenotype looks more cortical basal syndrome. Anyway, the, the, the student (laughs) afterwards, you know, after we got out of the room was like, wait, what made you do that? Right. Like, cause as a student, you're learning top to bottom neuro exam, right. And you're sort of just learning that pattern. And as you become more advanced in these skills, you start actually thinking about what does these things mean, right? And what does this translate to? Where does it localize? And mm-hmm. and and so as the information starts come flying at you, right? That's a different, as more analytical thinking, right? So you're going from illness scripts to more of that analytical process of taking in new right. information as it comes at you. Um, and so it's helpful to, to think about how we think about it because that keeps yeah. you humble and it does actually help you kind of take a step back and try to look at the larger picture and not anchor on like one particular diagnosis or another. Um, Yeah. So that actually was sort of an answer to my, one of the second questions I had on this list. So like one of the biggest lessons I learned was to make sure you don't anchor. (laughs) Um, Yeah. I I have another story that goes with that, but I'll let you go first because I feel like I've been talking for a bit. (laughs) So, so yeah. Uh, so anchoring, right, always a problem, uh, especially when we're kind of dealing with things like I, I think, right, we get we get the initial story from someone else, right? As mm-hmm. as neurologists, we're often consulted by somebody else. It's it's rare that we're the first person to see somebody, but um, at least in my experience. Yeah. But uh, I remember one woman that I saw uh, in the emergency department uh, a number of months ago. And I, you know, I get the story from 
the the emergency department resident, and it's like, oh, this this woman's had uh, you know gradually progressive numbness and weakness over the last week, and she's been having increasing difficulty walking. And I'm like, oh, and, and you know, I didn't ask what the reflexes were because I know that they didn't check. Probably them. didn't check him. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Uh, you know, I mean, that's it. It's fine. Uh, I just have you know, you gotta work with the, the frameworks that exist. Yes. But. I'm still in my back of my mind. I'm going to buy like, uh, you know, break in, you know, a reflex hammer in like a breaking case of suspected Guillaume Ray. Um, <laughs> but that was my suspicion going down there. Right. And right. I'm, uh, I'm talking to this patient and I mean, to be fair, she gives the exact same story that, that I got. And so I'm thinking in my head, like, well, this sounds a lot like Guillaume Ray. Mm-hmm. Uh, and uh, I'm examining her, right? We kind of do like, you know, our, our typical like seven, seven part exam. Uh, so, you know, nothing, mental status, totally fine. Just, you know, all that good stuff. Cranial nerves, nothing involved. Um, starting to get into strength, arms are fine. Legs, we start seeing a bit of weakness creeping in. And on sensory exam, you know, she does have uh, a slight kind of like a length dependent uh, sensory involvement in her lower extremities, kind of up to like the mid thigh or so mm-hmm. uh, to to all modalities. And I'm like, well, okay, so, so far, so far, so good. But then I, I go to do her reflexes mm-hmm. and they're brisk, ah, like, like very brisk, three pluses throughout. Oh, okay. Like, oh, <laughs> all right. Something, something, something funny else. is going on now. <laughs> yeah. Um, and I'm like, well, and I'm in my head. I'm like, you know, it's early. You, know, you can have preserved reflexes in Guillain-Barre, but I don't like it. Uh, <laughs> yeah. So, so we ended up getting MRIs um, before we initiated treatment, and it did show uh, a spinal cord lesion. Ultimately, ended up being uh, multiple sclerosis. Mm, I was wondering and, if we're going down that path. Yeah, yes, <laughs> yeah. that's exactly what it was. And it was one of those things where, yeah, it's like, you know, it, it, everything right up until that that single exam change was was very. Uh, suggestive of Guillain-Barre, but then, you know, it all fell apart, right? Like you get this new piece of information and it just kind of throws your whole expectation off kilter. And so you have to, you have to be adaptable to that. Like if something doesn't fit, you you can't just, you you can't force the square peg into the round hole. Right. Uh, It doesn't work. But people try that all the time. (laughs) I know. I mean, uh, I'm not gonna lie, right? I've been guilty of it. It's like, well, yeah. you know, it's a spectrum, blah blah blah. Sometimes it's like this, sometimes like that. Maybe it's still that. Sometimes it is, sometimes it isn't. Uh, so, I think, uh, and again, this is not new to this last year, but I think it's just been a lesson that is continually reemphasized. Is the again, I can, I think I can tie this a little bit together with your previous question. Is it's that humility aspect of saying like I don't know what this is. Here are a few things I think it could be. Yeah. Here's what we're going to do to start paring it down, and and being logical and methodical in our approach to like this is what the history suggests. This is what the exam suggests. These are our as you said potential localizations, and and working our way through these in a stepwise fashion so that we don't skip over potential diagnoses, uh, end up with with premature anchoring, uh, yeah. end up committing to a course of treatment which may be ineffective or potentially harmful. All these kinds of things that have these downstream sequelae uh, exactly. for for the person. Yeah. So so yeah, that's. I mean. <clears throat> As I said, it's not necessarily new in 2023, but it is. It's one of those things where I I think it's a a continual churn of of humility, if you yeah. will. Yeah. Well, it, and while it's not new, it's it's still something to, important to remind people of, because it again, it's just human tendency to want the round peg to fit in the square hole, right? right. And and yes. we're all susceptible to it. But it, it can lead to harm and it can lead to delays in diagnosis. And as we're talking about this, I keep thinking about this one elderly gentleman who I was actually on the console service and he had come in because he was getting a workup for some type of atypical migraine. And they had mm-hmm. ordered uh, blood vessel imaging. And to be honest, uh, I don't recall the exact results of the, of the imaging, uh, but it was something enough to Oh, you know, I think he had an incidental dissection or, you know, but it does, it's neither here nor there at the end of the story. Because mm-hmm. when I met the patient, 
he kept telling me it's not pain. Like I don't have a headache. And he just had such a hard time describing what he feels, but it was, you know, it was up here in his head that he would feel it, but it's not painful. Um, so I'm like, so you don't have a headache. He's like, no, and I've been trying to tell people this. It's not a headache. Right. But he's had this whole headache workup and he's been offered, you know, migraine treatments. And of course, none of those things were working because it wasn't a migraine. And, um, I asked him more questions about, you know, what brings it on, you know, the very basic questions that we're all taught in medical school. And it turns out that every time he stands, whenever he stands up, that's what triggers it. Right. And it feels better when he lies down. And then I started putting this all together with other features on his, his exam. So I also noticed some Parkinsonian features. Um, of course, you did. <laughs> of course <laughs> I did. I can't help it. <laughs> um, and it was just, you know, fortunate that I happened to be the consult attending on service that day. So I checked his blood pressure lying down and standing up and he had a 90 point drop in systolic blood pressure. Oh, that's, that's quite remarkable. Yes. Right. Like unignorable. <laughs> like this is right. not like, oh, maybe this is a possibility, right? This is definitely causing his symptoms. And so, yeah. So he ended up having um, atypical Parkinsonism mm. and with severe dysautonomia and the dysautonomia, that drop in blood pressure was causing this funny sensation. And a lot of my patients do have a hard time describing what that feels like. You know, unless they're passing out, right? Which I don't know how he did not pass out with a 90-point drop. But, you know, it probably doesn't feel good. <laughs> I, I can only imagine. Yeah. But, I, you know, to see this poor elderly man, and he had gone months trying to figure out what's going on. And that anchoring, right, that anchoring towards headache um, steered him completely down the wrong pathway for months. Yeah. Yeah. So that is always the the challenging part, right? Is uh, getting someone to describe a subjective experience in their own words, and then being able to you as the uh, the healthcare professional parsing that and fitting that into again, right? Like our our schemas for like how do I understand these things uh, in terms of right? Like it's not head ache, it's not head pain, it's like a discomfort or a sensation or right. Uh, I mean, the, like the classic examples like dizziness, right? What, is, yeah. what does dizziness mean? <laughs> yeah. Right. Um, which we won't go into today, but, uh, <laughs> but it's like, I think that's probably the most common thing that a lot of us like uh, ex- run into when we kind of run into these subjective descriptions of things. And uh, it's really hard to nail people down in terms of what do they mean precisely by that? And and sometimes it just isn't precise. And that's, that's, uh, just kind of lends itself to a little diagnostic uncertainty. Exactly. And that is one of the biggest lessons for me is being okay with a degree of uncertainty because mm. we tend to anchor because on some level we're not okay with it, right? We don't want to feel uncertain. We don't want to tell the patient, well, we're not sure what's going on with you. These are the possibilities, yeah. but we're not a hundred percent sure because we feel like they want answers. That's why they came to us. And I actually found that patients appreciate the honesty and as long as you're committed to figuring it out, right? right? That's what they want. They want someone committed to be on the journey with them. Mm -hmm. And, you know, it's it's not satisfying to not have an immediate answer, but I think it's less satisfying when you're given an immediate answer that's totally off the mark. Yeah. Um, yeah. I, I think, I think that's, that's very true. And, you know, you can probably speak to this as well. It's like how many times have, uh, you've gone in and you're, you're sitting down with somebody and you're like, and you're like, just, I need you to explain this to me as best, like, and like really getting into like the nitty gritty about someone's constellation of symptoms. And, you know, that in my experience is where the majority of, of these kind of aha moments do come from. It's like, Oh, Oh, it's yeah. like, now you get this little, this little grain of information that you're able to you know, grow into, into hopefully a proper diagnosis over time. It and, really uh, is. Yeah. Yeah. Like for me, it was him saying, it's not a headache. <laughs> right. I'm like, right. Well, okay, if it's not a headache, why are you being evaluated for a headache? <laughs> you know? Um, yeah. Because someone else said it was a headache, right? Yeah. And it's all over this chart. <laughs> yes. That's, that's always the problem. Right. And again, right. We talk about anchoring, 
uh, just reading the chart can be anchoring sometimes. Yeah. And uh, I definitely went through a phase where, <laughs> for better or worse, I don't do this quite as much anymore, where I would just uh, I would just get the chief complaint and I would just go see the patient and I, I wouldn't look at anything. Oh, and, wow. <laughs> you know, sometimes people will get mad at me because like, why don't you know this? It's in my chart. I'm like, well, you know, I want, just wanted a clean slate. Uh, some people are okay with that explanation, some not so much. Uh, so I, I tend to temper it a little bit in as much as, you know, looking at what kind of testing they've had done and like the general outline of why yeah. they're here. But a lot of times, you know, to your point, it's like, you know, I'll say like, oh, I'm here from the neurology department. Uh, they asked me to see you because someone said you were confused yesterday. And I get responses from like, like, yeah, I really was confused yesterday, but I feel better now. Or like, I wasn't confused. <laughs> They're uh, confused. <laughs> I, no, I mean, I literally had a guy... <laughs> Uh, it was like episodes of unresponsiveness and he's kind of this, you know, crusty old cantankerous sort of fella. <laughs> Some and, of my um, favorites. Right. And he's like, yeah, I was awake. I heard him talking to me. I just didn't want to respond to him. <laughs> well, you know, sometimes like, that oh. is actually true. <laughs> it is. I mean, you know, people are in the hospital. They don't feel well. Sometimes they just don't want to be bothered. Right. Um, but I mean, you know, those, those kinds of things, Some sometimes just saying like, hey, I'm here for this reason. Is that a concern to you? Yes. <laughs> and sometimes they're like, no, but, and they give you an entirely different thing that they're worried about. Yeah. So it is, it is definitely weighing, uh, what are the concerns of the medical team versus what are the concerns of the patient also? Yes. I like that. And I actually have a similar process because, you know, sometimes I'm like the ninth neurologist that someone is seeing right. and they'll come with a stack of papers. And I actually, yeah, I don't necessarily read through that entire stack because I don't want to be anchored or biased. And I, I do the same process as you. I try to just see what they're generally here for and what workup they've done because I'm not going to repeat unnecessarily any workup. Um, and that seems to be enough to satisfy people that I've read through their chart and I know enough about them, uh -huh. but also to be open-minded to you know what's going on and and not just say, oh, okay, so someone else has already diagnosed you with Parkinson's disease. So we'll just start there. And I'll, I'll tell yeah. patients that, well, this is a clinical diagnosis. And so I actually like to, I, I know you've already been through this journey and uh, you've landed on this diagnosis, but I kind of like to confirm for myself that I agree with what's been said before. And I may or may not. <laughs> right, right. That, I do find that uh, I, am, I am somewhat disagreeable from a diagnostic perspective sometimes. <laughs> I, I am too. I, I am, but... That's uh, not necessarily a bad thing, I think, right? So. You know, yeah. So it's it's okay to have, you know, everyone's uh, just like other parts of the body. Everyone has opinions, right? Exactly. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Um, can I ask you a harder reflect reflection question? All right. Let's go for it. <laughs> so what is the biggest risk that you've taken as a neurologist in the past year? So, <clears throat> so. I, I am somewhat risk averse just by by nature. I remember, you know, one of our mutual attendings, uh, Dr. Tracy Eicher, uh, <laughs> would often say of neurologists that quote neurologists are weenies. End quote. Um, I hope she's listening. <laughs> maybe she is. We'll have to send her this episode. But uh, I, I don't think I'm too bad about that. But but I do think that there are situations, right? So, you know, we both have different practice environments. You know, I'm, I'm in kind of more of a community uh, hospital situation where we don't have a particularly large neurology department. So sometimes I don't have um, subspecialty colleagues to, to call on for certain things. Um, but in terms of, I'm not going to say risky behavior, but diseases that are high risk in and of themselves. Mm -hmm. So, uh, I've been working a lot with some of our intensive care unit pharmacists to develop a proper status epilepticus protocol and with our ICU nursing staff uh, to get them comfortable with mm -hmm. treating this. So one of the, as you know, as neurologists may know, right, we've got status epilepticus, continuous seizure activity for five minutes, other sub definitions we're not going to get into, but, um, or, Beyond that, super refractory status, right, where we have people, um, a refractory would be where we put them on IV drips, put them into a medically induced coma, high high doses, right, uh, mm -hmm. compared to what people are normally using for just plain sedation in the intensive care unit when someone is on a ventilator. 
And so when I started uh, at this hospital, people were very uncomfortable, to say the least, with these kinds of dosing regimens. Yes, um, and, where you had a lot of looks. Uh, yes, yes, uh, definitely did. Uh, definitely a lot of questions directed in my direction as to, is this appropriate? Is this safe? What are we doing to make sure it is safe? And it has required a lot of a lot of work um, with with the different uh, intensivists as well as the uh, ICU nursing staff. And I think everyone's been uh, very open to the idea, right? If mm-hmm. like, you know, we're saying this is a standard of care, we're, we're enabling patients to receive care in the community without having to transfer them, you know, like right. 60 miles away to an academic center. Which is a little scary if they're in status. Mm-hmm. Right. It's not ideal in many, many ways. So especially because we are you know, still a level one trauma center, right? We still have a fairly high patient volume. Mm-hmm. And so being able to provide some of these services, and I'm somewhat fortunate that I, I have an epileptology background uh, to, to lean on, which I know not every general neurologist is going to have in their back pocket. But, but um, these protocols are nicely written and available online. They are. Or there right. are existing protocols. Yeah. For for people who are not epileptologists out there. Right. The Neurocritical Care Society, the American Epilepsy Society, they all have guidelines that people can follow when we start getting into these uh, dosing ranges. The tricky part is the continuous EEG monitoring, which is not readily available in many hospitals, although I think that is becoming more common. But having the familiarity, uh, right, because this isn't something that comes up every day or even every week, but... um, knowing when it is appropriate to institute these kinds of treatments and what are the relative risks and benefits in these patients and how aggressive to treat and all those sorts of things are things that uh, over time I've had to work with on the different, you know, because we have three different ICUs at our hospital, which I know, you know, some people may scoff at. It's on the smaller side. It's okay. Mm -hmm. But um, getting people familiar with these protocols in each of these different departments has been an ongoing process. I've been very fortunate. I have some uh, some advocates for this project in the pharmacy departments in terms of moving this forward in terms of uh, standardized order sets. Right, we're on we're on Epic, so getting those things through is like an act of God. <laughs> but they've been they've been very persistent with it, and I appreciate that. And so getting everyone on this same page and, and order sets does make it easier, right? If you can get them right, yeah. So so not necessarily a risk as much as like if it doesn't work right uh, it can be high risk in terms of uh injury to people either from uh the incorrect treatment or insufficient treatment also yeah so so i i think that's what i would say at present uh as my quote-unquote riskiest uh endeavor in the last year well, you know, as physicians, I think we all are a little risk adverse and we all want to practice evidence-based medicine. So, right, you know, because right. I've, I've had patients come in and say that they want to, you know, do some experimental stem cell treatment in another country. And I'm like, well, I can't really recommend that. So I, I won't say I take risks like that. <laughs> but <laughs> <laughs> um, but I, I do try to keep an open mind. One thing I told myself is that I never want to tell a patient that there's nothing I can do. It always breaks my heart a little bit when I have a patient that's come to me and said that, well, everyone's told me that I can't do anything. And even if I can't cure what they have, which is very common in movement disorders, um, if there's something I can do to improve the quality of life, I want to try it. Mm -hmm. And weighing the risk and benefits of different treatments to get to that point can sometimes be challenging and I, I think I actually told you a little bit about this case that I have of a young, uh, he's somewhere in his 30s uh, with uh, post-anoxic myoclonus. So uh, he had a cardiac arrest and he survived. Um, mm-hmm. But now he has these, for for people who don't know what myoclonus is, it's jerky movements. And it could be isolated to one part of the body or it could be diffuse. Um, so he has generalized my, like his whole body is involved and, um, he has both basically action induced myoclonus. He has negative myoclonus as well. So that's hard. Yeah. (laughs) He has everything basically. So he, while he's like muscularly strong, because his mm-hmm. parents, his family has like worked him out and made sure that he's doesn't, you know, waste away basically, which is great. 
but he still can't stand because his legs would keep giving out from the negative myoclonus, right? And same thing when he tries to use his hand to reach for a fork, right? It just keeps jerking. And you can only imagine how hard it is to live that way. And he's young. And of course, his family is very reasonably concerned about, you know, what his future is going to look like. And he's been on many medications and, you know, this type of myoclonus is very classically refractory, right? And you read up on it and it's like, well, yeah, this is very hard to treat. And I was like, okay, thanks. <laughs> right. And um, I never want to set expectations that I'm going to be able to fix this, of course. But mm -hmm. I wanted to keep an open mind to trying maybe if there's something he hasn't tried yet to try it out. Um, mm -hmm. And so I, this was the case where I decided to try phenobarbital with him which mm -hmm. I can't say I've ever really prescribed that as an outpatient, right? You know, uh, especially in the world of epilepsy, right? We have so many better anti-epileptic drugs. The only time I, I really I, use phenobarb yeah. is for status, <laughs> right? I, I will say that I have used it on the outpatient side, but usually in people who have already been on it for yeah. a number of years. Right, like back in the day when that's what we had and that's what they've been right. on and you don't want to rock the boat and now their brain's used to it and so you keep it going, right? <laughs> Absolutely. Yeah. But it's not necessarily something you'd like, you know, immediately reach towards. <laughs> no, no, it's not. Yeah. Because it, it does have some icky long-term side effects and, you know, mm -hmm. it's it's not the kindest drug. But as his family had pointed out, you know, his quality of life is fairly poor. And, you know, it, it's is it worth trying something? And yeah. So, and is it, socially, this was also a complex situation too, which is kind of what made this a little bit risky too. Like, are they going to be able to handle this kind of drug when he's already on four other medications um, that can all interact, right? It's like... Right. So the yeah. pharmacology gets a little hairy. Yeah. Yeah. Because he was on, um, he was on Depico, Paranthamo. Um, he was also on Lorazepam. Mm-hmm. And I'm missing one right now. But anyway, so I was like, well, let's get the Depakote off first before we put the phenobarb on, which uh, unfortunately made his myoclonus even worse. He had to go to the hospital, you know. Yeah. But it it did pay off. Um, he's been hospitalized twice in this whole process. But <laughs> Oh, geez. I know. Um, but yeah, there was a point where we loaded him with phenobarb and he had no myoclonus. It just went away. Unfortunately, it did not last, though. Um, oh. Yeah, I, I saw him in follow-up, and it's kind of back to where it was. So I've now increased the phenobarb a little bit more to see. And I'm thinking about trying to wean off some of his other medications. But for me, this was, do I take this risk? Because I'm not the first person to treat him, too, at my institution. You know, he was mm -hmm. uh, initially followed by um, my colleagues in uh, epilepsy. And mm -hmm. he's never had um, any EEG correlates to these movements. And I think yeah. they've also kind of tried everything they could think of. And, it, you know, <laughs> like he's been on so many different combinations of medication. Yeah. It was even hard to kind of track like the changes and that were made or even why certain medications were switched. Um, yeah. Before I, you know, before I inherited him, before his the last neurologist I saw him before me was like, well, let's get another opinion in here. And mm -hmm. maybe this is more appropriate for a movement disorder specialist since there is no EEG correlate since you're not having seizures technically. Um, yeah. Yeah. You do start to wonder um, with something so medically refractory, right? You're really moving up against the the edge of, of that evidence-based medicine. Yes. And so you start to wonder like, like would, would DBS be appropriate? What about a posterior corpus callosotomy? Right. You know, like all these kinds of things that we use for other somewhat tangentially related disorders. Exactly. Um, but it is like, it's, it's kind of the wild west a little bit. It is. It feels that way. Um, there are case reports of phenobarb, right? And oh. Aren't there always? <laughs> yes, exactly. But, you know, that's, that's what I'm operating off of. And so... But yeah, and then yeah, do I escalate this even further to try mm -hmm. something more radical? And it's hard to know, right? Because evidence-based medicine does start somewhere, right? There is a first right. person who's tried this. Who's, Someone had to be the first. Yeah, right? <laughs> exactly. But at the same time, I don't. You don't want to cause harm, right? And I worry about that too. 
yeah. 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 That's, that's very challenging. Yeah. So, well, hopefully, you know, I don't know. I, I, I don't know what I'll do when I start running out of medications <laughs> to try, but maybe bring them up to the surgical committee and see what they think. Yeah. We do have a DBS committee, so that is something. But, you know, like you said, most people are risk adverse, and I don't have any data to say that this yeah. would. Um, you know, I haven't specifically looked up if someone's tried DBS for for this condition. So, Is this, uh, would it be accurate to say these are Lance Adams uh, myoclonus? Yeah. Okay. Just just making sure I was remembering correctly. Yep. That's correct. Yeah. Um, yeah. Very challenging. I've only seen one true case myself uh, in my career and thankfully he was fairly easily controlled but oh that's good yeah yeah i mean i feel like you know a lot of these patients probably don't even survive right <clears throat> well kind of uh that's that's one of those things uh, how i typically understand it is that it's one of those things you kind of diagnose post post hoc uh where it's like well if they have early myoclonus after a cardiac arrest uh at some point they they have a high mortality, obviously we know that. Yeah. But if they don't survive, well then it wasn't Lance Adams, right? If they wake up, well then it's Lance Adams, right? <laughs> right, right, exactly. Yep. Uh so it is one of those things where who knows what the the true incidence is, I think. It's it's kind of one of those uh self fulfilling prophecy types of situations that we run into in the neurocritical care literature. Yes. And myoclonus in general, I think, is especially when we're talking about cortical, subcortical localization. I, I always think it's an interesting like, does it belong in epilepsy or does it belong in movement disorders? <laughs> you know, like if we put yeah, EEGs yeah. like on the brain, right? <laughs> Would we see something? Right. <laughs> right. Cause he's not, yeah. he's had it, is, it is one of those not. things that's very interesting, right? If we, especially if we know that, that they had an anoxic brain injury, right? We know that there was probably damage to both cortical and subcortical structures. Right. Um, so it is, it is kind of interesting. It's a very challenging etiology conceptually. Uh, like anoxic brain injury just in general is something that I think we're still learning so much more about. And like what are the, the appropriate acute and, uh, and then more long-term measures that are going to lend themselves to the best outcomes. It's a very interesting area that's kind of, I think, still in development. And the whole, you know, people don't always look like their MRIs of their brains, right? Right, right. Because his brain looks pretty good. Yeah. Yeah. But, you know, from a symptom perspective, it, right. it's very right. challenging. So it's, yeah. Hmm. Yeah. So one last question. All right. Lay on me. <laughs> um, biggest surprise in 2023. Biggest surprise in 2023. Yeah. Surprising things. Um, oh God. I don't know. Every day is a surprise. Uh, <laughs> In neurology, no, uh, it often is. We get used to being surprised, I think, and we just kind of run with it. <laughs> yeah. Uh, I mean, to an extent, yes. Um, I'm trying to think. Was there anything in the in the literature that was like, oh, my gosh, what a practice-changing thing? Um, I mean, there's a couple things that were like, you know, somewhat surprising, but not like hugely surprising. Um. I don't know. I, I'm gonna I'm gonna give a cop out answer, and uh, <laughs> that's fine. And say, you know, working again, working in, on the more acute neurology side of things. That that you know, I do get. I don't want to say daily, but probably multiple times per week when I'm working, I, I do get surprised by, like, oh, like that's what the MRI shows, or oh, yeah. uh, <laughs> this person's getting better. I mean, you know, there can be good surprises too. Yeah, there can be good surprises um, too. Yes, but. Uh, but yeah, I would I would say that uh, it is it is kind of a uh, nearly daily occurrence uh, in my in my current practice setup. And um, so what keeps neurology fun? What does keep neurology fun? I do I do like I don't know. It's it's one of those things where when I started out, I, I struggled a little bit with the, the diagnostic uncertainty. Mm -hmm. But but I think to an extent, it is kind of that that thrill of the chase. Like, what is this diagnosis? I want I want to know. I want to solve the puzzle. Yes. Um, and I, I do think that that is that is a driving force for me. Is that uh, the intellectual curiosity that that comes along with some of these? Mm -hmm. You know, um, they talk a lot about uh, challenges when you're challenging yourself. 
intellectually. Mm -hmm. You want it to be hard, but not too hard. Yes. And that's that's how I like my cases to be. <laughs> <laughs> yes. um, mostly just, and I don't mind those like really hard cases, but in my, again, in my current environment, that if I know this person would be better served by a place that has better resources. resources or better turnaround time or uh, certain subspecialists that would be better suited to the initial diagnostic workup, I find those a little more frustrating just because I know that they could get better served uh, by by somebody else. And so those are not surprising, uh, but <laughs> they are frustrating. Yes. And so I think kind of going back to that reflective piece, it's like knowing knowing what you don't know. Um, you know, there's that uh, that one quote uh, from, I think it was Donald Rumsfeld, uh, you know, not, not a political quote, but uh, <laughs> there are the known knowns known unknowns and unknown unknowns exactly which i think uh i think it's a kind of a pithy saying essentially that's like you know well i know what i know and i know some of the things that i don't know mm -hmm. but i need to be aware that there are things that i don't know of which i am unaware yes and so trying to be cognizant of that that gap um or as uh, one of again one of our attendings told me as dr ludwig uh, if you don't know it, you can't diagnose it. Yeah. So right, you have to look for so, it. Right. So so knowing if it's like this looks like a disorder, but I don't know what. Um, not being afraid to to call in that second opinion, right, yeah. or third, or fourth, or however far down mm -hmm. the chain we happen to be at this point in time. Yeah. And, uh, or and knowing, maybe like, read up on what you're seeing, or exactly, yeah, doing research. some research. Mm -hmm. Exactly, digging deep. And uh, seeing like what kind of testing do I need to do, and that's always a challenging part, right? I, I don't have a lot of longitudinal follow up with a lot of these patients, although I'm looking to. That's part of my my future for 2024 is I do want to start doing some more outpatient clinic again and getting back into that longitudinal aspect of patient care. Mm -hmm. But because um, I do miss out on that, is that that longer term work, yeah. right? Not not everything's going to be solved in just a few days on the inpatient right. uh, yep. side of care. I would say probably isn't going to be most of the time. So being uh being able to to look through that lens and uh reflecting on that a little bit I think is is very important. Absolutely. I don't know if that I, I veered from your original question. But, uh, <laughs> that's, that's totally that's fine. Answer. <laughs> but I, I think it's an important point to make about accepting our uncertainties and learning to be okay with it. Because yeah. Yeah, when when we're not okay with it, that's when we make mistakes, and that's when, yeah, you know, patients can be harmed. Right. I saw someone on Twitter uh, post this way where they or X, I guess it is now. Um, it's like being okay telling someone, "I don't know what this is, but I'm going to find out with you." Yeah. Um, and then making a good faith effort to do that. So I think, I mean, right? No one's going to be. Right. Uh, Dr. House is a fictional character for a reason. Yes. <laughs> and uh, being able to to recognize where we don't know and then being able to apply those logical diagnostic reasoning processes to someone's presentation and working through a, a workup um, to get to an answer. I think that's I think that's very helpful, even if it is, like you said, something that doesn't necessarily have a treatment let a, or, or let alone a cure yeah. then um sometimes knowing what it is what can be expected right that prognosis mm -hmm. uh can be just as important depending on the person you know are they do they have children do they need to worry about uh their family providing all those kinds of things right these uh yeah psychosocial aspects of life that i think uh a lot of times for those of us outside of the psychiatric field, we kind of focus more on the biological model of disease and not the biopsychosocial. Mm -hmm. So I do think that is, it's something that we all uh, fall short of from time to time, I'm sure. Yeah. And, you know, going back to that um, metacognitive process of thinking outside of how we thinking about thinking, right. <laughs> That's what it is. Mm -hmm. um, I, I do wish that we put more emphasis on this, when we're teaching medical students, right? It's one thing to learn illness scripts, but 
Right. No one's going to walk in with multiple choices. Right. <laughs> and, <laughs> right. Just written on their forehead. Right. Yeah. It's either A, B, C, or D. <laughs> yes. Um, but we, that's how we are training our students to think. Right. And then they have to mm-hmm. rewire that when they're in residency. I feel like that's what happens to accept uncertainty, to work through the process of information flying at you and just doing your best. Right. Um, yeah chasing that puzzle of the unknown and also bridging the understanding to the patient because they're also lost. Right. And they're looking to you to be a guide. And Mm -hmm. I take a lot of satisfaction in my job of being a, trying to be a good guy, even if I don't have the answer. Right. And yeah. So I don't have a great answer for this question either. I I think, I don't know why I'm surprised by this, but I am always surprised by my patient's gratitude. (laughs) Um, Right. And that that's like that therapeutic relationship, right? It's someone is listening, someone is attending to it. And I'm able to hopefully trust this person uh, who is providing care to me. So, so I definitely think that there is that that element to it, right? That uh, we want to look back at that historical patient physician relationship. Yeah, it is. It is one that engenders trust. And right, this goes all the way back to uh, to Hippocrates, when you look through his manuscripts and stuff, it talks about this kind of relationship and how one should comport oneself um, so that you you don't violate that that trust that's put in you. Exactly. And in December, you know, it was like two days before or three days before Christmas, I had clinic, mm-hmm. and a lot of my patients showed up with Christmas cards and well, one person, the the care partner of the patient made me like a ceramic vase with a flower. Oh, that's nice. yeah. And it's just that they, that deep level of gratitude. And, you know, I, I didn't necessarily cure their illness or give them all the answers, but it was a nice reminder of how important that relationship, that trust that you build, what that is. And yeah, so it took me by surprise though. <laughs> Right. Yeah, that it it does sometimes our perspective is not the same as as the other person's perspective, right? Which I mean, it sounds obvious when you say it out loud. I know, but. right? I feel almost silly saying like this is surprising, but when yeah. this person handed me this card and I was like, you didn't have to give me anything. And right. they said, "Well, we're just we're just so grateful." Yeah. And that is, I think that's, that's something we, we come across over and over again. Like if, if people are out there reading different things like these, these ancient reflections, it's that, um, you never know what, what kind of good you're, you somewhat like what you might perceive as nothing might be everything to somebody else. Yeah. And that's like, I'm just yeah, doing my job. <laughs> right. Like I, uh, I saw again, right. To put a little more humorous spin on it. Uh, <clears throat> There's a, another another post on on X where it was like uh, some guy out there got a compliment from from a woman on this shirt two years ago, and you know every time he pulls that shirt out, he's still thinking about that compliment he got about how he looked nice. <laughs> so it is it's one of those things, right? Where it's like a, a kind word uh, here and there, and you know demonstrating that you you care about people. It uh, it is something that that is valued, and you know I think it does go to those deeper ethical questions about about what does it mean to to care for someone in a society yeah. you know even beyond just uh in a healthcare setting yeah and maybe a good reminder to listeners to show your gratitude right you a lot of us think about how oh this is nice mm-hmm. or oh, that person was nice and we don't always tell the person how we feel about that right. and it goes a long way people really carry that yeah yes that's that is something i always I try to be cognizant of that, like with my trainees as well, right? It's like, ah, you did a really great job this week. You know, I I appreciate your help. Yeah. Um, Because it is, it's one of those things where, you know, sometimes that little attaboy, it it really means something. (laughs) It does. I know when, when I was a resident, that always meant the world to me. It's like, ah, I did a good job. You know, I'm appreciated. I appreciate, I appreciate being appreciated. Yeah. You know, you need to know that your efforts mean something and yes. It, it that getting that feedback that it does right is where it's just gold sometimes right right it's it it takes very little um yeah to just demonstrate right just just say what you're feeling but um but yeah uh any final thoughts as as we close out our our reflections ashley 
Well, I'll say that I am grateful to be here on this podcast with you and to have this conversation, this reflective practice on a Saturday snowy morning in January. Um, this has been well, and- fantastic. I'm grateful that you suggested it as well. It's it's always fun to have a chat with you. We get to get kind of go outside of our usual uh, neurology education boxes on the show here. So thank you as always. Although I am eventually going to pin you down and make <laughs> you do your movement disorders shtick on the show eventually. <laughs> yes, stay tuned. That we can do that for sure. <laughs> <laughs> All right. If people want to find you, where should they look? Uh, Twitter or X is a good place. Um, my Twitter handle is uh, Shaking Palsy. That's S H A K I N G P A U L S Y. So that's my spin yes. on Palsy. An excellent pun. Thank you. For Dr. Paul. <laughs> Um, uh, you can also find me on X slash Twitter at uh, Dr. Kentris. That's D R K E N T R I S. You can also find the other projects we're working on at theneurotransmitters.com. And uh, you can subscribe to our newsletter there to get notified of future episodes and also weekly updates on interesting little neurology education tidbits from around the internet. So thank you all again for listening if you've made it this far, and we will see you all next time. <laughs>